For the last part of this module, we're going to talk about immobility and associated problems. So, um, of all the different disorders we talk about, there are some of them that we really can't do a lot in physical therapy. Um, cancers, uh, different organ diseases, um, that sort of thing. But the one thing we can do in all of those situations is we can help combat the complications that are caused by immobility. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about basically the complications of immobility and the problems that are associated with it. So um, terminology, as always, there's um, terminology. So when we have um, immobility, it can involve just one part of the body. So say that you had shoulder surgery and your arm is in a sling. So your shoulder is affected, but also the other joints that have to be um, immobilized the elbow and the wrist and the finger joints can be affected as well. Um, so if you have something like a stroke where one side of the body is affected, um, it's called hemiplegia, paralysis on one side of the body. Paraplegia is paralysis of the lower half of the body. And quadriplegia or tetraplegia is paralysis of the trunk and all four limbs. Usually the head is not involved. Diplegia is symmetrical par um, paralysis in any area of the body, so it can be, you know, both feet, both hands, symmetrical. That's the um, definition of diplegia. So, when um, you're inactive, when your body is supine, you're lying on your back, um, because you're in intensive care or because you um, have a serious illness, the loss of gravity affects the body's natural functions. It affects your digestive system. It affects your respiratory system. It affects the circulation of blood. Um, bed rest um, alters your metabolism. It alters your renal function. So um, sometimes bed rest is what you need to recover from the other thing, but it is not good for you. So um, with inactive muscle, you lose strength and endurance and muscle mass. The muscle atrophies. It gets smaller and it weaker. So um, prolonged bed rest can lead to loss of almost half the muscle strength. So um, that's, that's a huge big deal. So loss of muscle strength due to immobility progresses at a rate of about 12% each week. So after three to five weeks of immobility due to bed rest, almost one half of the muscle strength is lost. That is huge. That could be the difference between being independent and um, having to have someone help you get up and go to the bathroom or um, make your food for you or something like that. So um, correct positioning. I know um, you worked on this in your labs this summer. Um, positioning and reduction of abnormal stress on immobilized muscles is important because you can get contractures from the muscles shortening and um, that can alter your movement and your biomechanics. So um, you lack, lack of weight bearing activity and muscle action also reduces osteoblastic activity in the bones and osteoclastic activity continues. That's the breakdown of bones. So your bone density gets less. So when um, astronauts go to the International Space Station, um, I some of you might be old enough to remember um, when astronauts went to the moon. I was a little kid at the time, um, but they would get, you know, you'd see on TV, they would the capsule would splash down and the aircraft carrier would go to pick them up and they'd be sort of debilitated, but they, they could walk off, they'd help them out. Well, now when astronauts come back from the International Space Station, they strap them down to backboards and put cervical collars on and everything to make sure they're not going to break a bone because lack of gravity while they're in space um, decreases their bone density significantly. So um, just changing your relationship to gravity by being immobile can have that those devastating effects on your bone mass as well. So your tendons and ligaments require movement to maintain their structure and function. Um, Prolonged immobility will shorten connective tissue structures and increase their density, resulting in limited flexibility and range of motion. So you see the picture here where the um, person's feet are um, in plantar flexion and a little bit of inversion. Um, a lot of times 
you get in that position, if someone's lying supine or if they're sitting up in a wheelchair like this person um, and they don't have the muscle structure to um, bring their feet up, the flexor muscles, um, basically the plantar flexor muscles are stronger than the dorsiflexor muscles and um, so you get more uh, atrophy in your dorsiflexors and so once you have that um, shortening of the Achilles tendon and the structure it's much harder for you to stand when you get to the point where you can stand so one of the things that um, we can do to help prevent contractures is proper positioning we can recommend um, bracing and um, soft splints to keep people in the right position we can stretch them passively while they're inactive so a lot of what we do when the person can't do anything can make a huge effect on what we do when they finally can do something. So um, the, there are a lot of effects on um, the skin and the cutaneous system as well um, when someone is immobile. So the lack of muscular activity um, impairs the blood return in the venous system and it can cause pooling of blood in, de in um, dependent areas of the body. So if your legs are hanging down, it can cause pooling of blood in your legs. So that decreases your cardiac output because you don't have that venous refill. And um, it can cause dizziness or fainting when changing position. The other thing that happens in the hospital is some people are on different medications, possibly. Um, they're say that they're on a high blood pressure medication normally at home when they're up and moving around now you lie them down and they're still on that same medication and their blood pressure is abnormally depressed from being immobile then you try to get them up and they're super dizzy so if you got them up on a regular basis even if you had them sit on the edge of the bed that's going to do a lot towards um, normalizing their blood flow and preventing the dizziness or fainting when changing position. So um, the other thing that happens when you have a um, breakdown of skin and muscle and bone is you get um, from that breakdown of muscle you get elevated serum levels of nitrogen waste because um, that's what that's a, a byproduct of muscle metabolism and that can cause um, kidney stones or um, problems with the urinary system. So you can also get um, high serum calcium level that can further impede muscle activity. Um, and you can actually get complete loss of muscle tone or flaccicity. Um, passive range of motion exercises and weight bearing or at least sitting up on a regular basis are helpful in preventing the complications. So sometimes you'll have um, most of the beds in ICU um, units these days um, can be converted into a chair position and it's super super helpful to get people up into that chair position to, to change their respiratory status, to change their blood flow, to help prevent some of these, um, these uh, consequences of immobility. So um, the shortening of the connective tissues happens about after about four to six days. Days! That's a really short amount of time. Um, that's a big, huge deal. So, what you can get um, when you have immobility in terms of the skin is you can actually get skin breakdown. So, you're immobile and you're lying down and you have um, diminished venous return so you have poor circulation potentially anemia because your um, iron's not getting circulated your oxygen's not getting circulated edema because you have lack of the um, muscle pump that's helping with that fluid return um, with older adults or um, disabled people they have remember when we talked in aging about they have um, less subcutaneous tissue or the subcutaneous tissue thins and so they have um, less padding basically. Um, you can have loss of sensation in the dependent areas. You can get mechanical irritation or friction so if somebody's lying they can get on their bony prominences on the back of their heels and on their um, ischial tuberosities in the back of their sacrum they can actually get friction that damages the skin. 
They can get excessive moisture from perspiration or urine because if they're unable to turn, the moisture is trapped between them and the surface. And they, if they're unable to turn, they also can't get up and use the bathroom, so there might be um, issues with urine and other body fluids. And they can't take a bath because, um, they're, you know, they're immobile. So um, they, have, they also can't eat or hydrate properly, so they have inadequate nutrition or hydration. And um, trauma to the skin just from moving around because um, you, you can't move around normally. So all of that stuff contributes to skin breakdown, which can eventually result in um, an ulceration. And ulcers can be life-threatening skin ulcers, pressure sores. So the um, cardiovascular system is also affected. We talked about the um, lack of venous return. So initially, if somebody's completely immobilized, blood pools in their trunk, and you might get increased venous return just because of that back pressure from the blood pooling in the trunk. With prolonged immobility, the venous return and the cardiac output are reduced. So that can result in orthostatic hypotension, which is um, lowered blood pressure at change of position. So you sit someone up and they're dizzy. They could faint. They might be pale and sweaty and have a rapid pulse. So um, when the muscles are in a relaxed state in the um, veins, in the legs, the closed valve prevents the, blo the blood from flowing backwards. When, when you actually move and your muscles contract, it squeezes the vein, it opens the valve, and it allows the blood to flow towards the heart. So if you're completely immobile and your muscles aren't moving, it reduces that venous return. So, um, if somebody has had a long bed rest and then they get their mobility back, you know, or they get the ability to move again, it might take weeks for their cardiovascular reflex controls to return to normal. So, um, blood pooling is called stasis. And so if you have blood pooling or stasis in an individual area, you get increased capillary pressure and edema. And that promotes thrombus or clot formation in the veins, particularly in the deep leg veins. So um, blood clotting in patients with dehydration or cancer um, might be accelerated by increased venous pressure or damage to blood vessels. So um, immobility, um, blood pooling can really cause a lot of problems because if you have blood clots and the clot breaks off, it could go to your brain or your lungs and um, cause a huge problem. So when you, just, the, when you move or with massage, um, blood clots or thrombi can break away, causing the pulmonary embolus. Um, venous stasis, which is where the blood is pooling in the veins, it's, it just clots a lot more easily, and you can get blood vessel damage, and you increase the chance of your um, deep vein thrombosis. So it's, um, it's really not a pretty picture. <laughs> So you could take someone who's really not that bad off and make them immobile, and you could make them a lot worse. So um, movement is good, and we want to get people to do it. With um, respiratory effects, you have decreased metabolism, respira respirations are slow and shallow, and deep breathing and coughing are more difficult. So a lot of times after surgery um, or in the hospital, people will have um, what they call an incentive spirometer. It's the little... Um, device that you blow into and it has numbers marked on it so you can see how much air you're blowing out and they encourage people to use it so when we go into somebody's room to do physical therapy we can say have you used your incentive spirometer in the last hour here let's do it show me how much you can do you can encourage them to use that and if they um, breathe deeply and cough as a result of it that is good because coughing clears secretion from the lungs Sometimes when they're on sedatives or anal analgesics, it can depress their neuromuscular activity and it depresses the respiratory control center as well, so they're not um, breathing as evenly. And that can cause, because they can't cough and they can't breathe deeply and their uh, respiratory system is depressed, they can have increased secretion in the lungs, which can cause pneumonia or atelectasis, which is where the alveoli actually collapse. 
So um, in this picture, the normal lungs, they're the alveoli, they can open up. Well, if they fill up with fluid, that is so much less um, range for oxygen exchange, and you can um, have a lot of problems resulting from that. So um, a lot of times respiratory therapists um, in a hospital or um, skilled nursing setting will uh, do breathing exercises as a part of their post-operative period. Um, they usually leave the incentive spirometer um, in the room and when we go in for their PT session we can encourage them to use it. And um, that's one of the things you learn how to, to use it as well. If you don't know how, ask your friendly neighborhood respiratory therapist and they will teach you and you can teach your patients. So that's something we can really do for people. Um, the other thing we can do um, for people with breathing is we can teach them proper breathing and we can teach them proper positioning to have the best um, uh, effect on their respiratory system. So that's a big deal. So the digestive system is really affected um, when you're immobile. Um, kind of the major um, thing that happens, well of course you usually get decreased dietary intake um, just because you you feel like crap, you're not hungry. <laughs> Your appetite is reduced. Um, you might be in a protein deficit, what they call a negative nitrogen imbalance. Um, inactivity causes constipation. If you're in that dependent position with muscle inactivity, you, your peristalsis just doesn't work as well. You usually have reduced food, fiber, and fluid intake, and um, constipation can be a big deal. So if you can't get up to use the bathroom, a lot of times in the um, hospital they want you to use a bedpan. It is really hard to use a bedpan. You are just not in the right position for elimination and that can um, contribute to constipation as well. Um, so sometimes if someone can't maintain their nutrition, they will do um, either a tube feeding or total um, parenteral nutrition, TPN, where they um, actually put in a nasogastric tube or they put a tube directly into the small intestine um, and they it's this liquid stuff that goes in through the tube that's their nutrition. So um, I always say when I'm uh, working in the hospital and uh, somebody's on TPN, I go, great, they don't have to take a break for lunch. Let's go walk. <laughs> Let's do some exercises. Not really. Of course, I'm being, I'm being flippant about it. But it is important that people maintain their um, nutrition and fluid intake. So with prolonged immobility, um, longer than when someone's in the hospital, if um, they have increased caloric intake that exceeds their energy need, that can um, contribute to obesity developing. Um, for a while on uh, Discovery Health and some of the different channels on TV, they had a bunch of shows about um, people that were super overweight. And for some reason, I was fascinated by those shows. And they had this one guy who... Um, he had been a paramedic. He was he was always a big guy, but he was pretty active. And he broke both his ankles, and it made it so he couldn't walk. So he was immobile for a large amount of time, and his wife fed him the whole time he was immobile, and he gained enough weight that he was never able to walk again after that. He finally ended up going to an inpatient um, facility so he could... Um, learn to, uh, you know, lose the weight and learn to walk again, and he was working extensively with PT on that. So that can be an issue with prolonged immobility. And the more you're immobile, the weaker you get, the heavier you are, and the weaker you are, the harder it is to move around. And so that can be a huge problem for people. So um, the urinary system is, of course, affected. Um, stasis of urine in the kidneys or bladder um, can happen because you're not getting the normal drainage that you get with gravity. So when you get um, urine pooling in the kidney or bladder, um, it's a predisposing factor for developing stones. So if people have extra calcium in their blood because of bone breakdown, and they have stasis of urine in the kidneys or bladder, that is like a setup situation for kidney stones. Um, a lot of times, 
Um, and you can induce, introduce a source of infection with catheters if, if people are forced to use a catheter. So they don't want to catheterize people unless it's absolutely necessary um, because that's a, just another way to introduce a source of infection. So um, you get an increase of diuresis, which is the um, elimination of water, which results in dehydration. Um, there are a variety of reasons why that, happen why that happens. A lot of it is just the altered metabolism um, changes your um, hormone levels in your blood, um, putting you into a diuretic effect. And um, it increases overall urine output, but you're not getting adequate fluid intake, so that leads to dehydration. The um, neural effects can be pretty devastating as well when you get the continuous pressure on the skin and the subcutaneous tissue um, it stimulates mechanoreceptors and pain receptors and other sensory receptors um, you can get muscle spasms because of nerve damage and then you can get um, problems with muscle innervation as well so um, with edema that can also cause excess pain because it presses on the nerves um, and so all of those things contribute to more immobility. It's sort of a um, downward spiral, basically. So because of the pain, um, it can have some psychological effects. So this person, now they don't have control of their environment. They don't have any privacy or independence. They are dependent on people for everything, and they're in pain. Um, that can cause depression and um, mental health related problems. Um, they can be, the problems can, that can develop can be depression, anxiety, confusion, forgetfulness. Um, it's a very stressful situation for people and it can um, shift your stress hormones, your um, corticosteroids in your body. And that can, again, affect your physiologically and your, your physiological system and your overall health. So um, immobility is the enemy, basically. And as um, physical therapist assistants, we can help combat that. It's one of the things that we can do in almost every situation is we can help um, mobilize the person and decrease the effects of immobility. We can also educate the person about the effects of immobility and why it's so important for them to move.